In 2013, me and my mate James quit our jobs to go backpacking around the world for nine months. This trip is way bigger than anything I've ever done before. We filmed the entire trip as we traveled through 20 countries in four continents, from Hong Kong to New York. All right, picnic spot. One of the best camping spaces ever. <laughs> Despite our low expectations, the 11-part series eventually took off on YouTube, and today it has over two and a half million views. Oh, yeah, 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 you like that one, yeah. And so we're now taking the time to look back at the trip in these retrospective films. I the entire trip you showed me that is what I want to see. In this second part, we'll look at how I actually edited the series. I saw that clip of us, I was like, oh my God. And that felt like a lifetime ago. We'll talk about how the trip changed our lives. If I think back to like 10 years before that, when I was like ready to give up my career and just miserable. From there to running my own tour in Morocco was just, it was just overwhelming. That's what it's all about. Cheers. <laughs> And of course, relive some of our favorite moments from the second half of the trip. I wanted to do it, but I really, really didn't want to do it. I'm about to jump 134 meters. <laughs> for some reason, for some reason. <laughs> what pushed you to do it like then? You, because you're an arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> We were coming up to the halfway point of the trip and traveling down the east coast of Australia, we were just having the time of our lives, going from one great adventure to another and making tons of great friends along the way. Yay! But in terms of the video, I was getting pretty burnt out because it was like four and a half months worth of filming and I was just getting sick of it and I was, didn't think I'd filmed enough, it wasn't gonna work. And so by the time I got down to Sydney and Melbourne, I've hardly filmed anything and I was pretty much ready to give up on the video. And then we flew to New Zealand, and New Zealand's where I spent a few months in 2006 on a working holiday visa, and it's my favorite country in the world, love it to death, so it was really great to be back there. But I still didn't feel much to begin with, like the first couple of days on the Kiwi experience, I barely turned the camera on. But then we got to Hobbiton. Guys, excited. <laughs> there we are, finally! I feel like a hobbit. <laughs> Yeah, they just stand there. <laughs> they walk like this. Which version of Lord of the Rings did you see? <laughs> I don't remember them doing that. <laughs> Being the big Lord of the Rings geek that I am, I thought, well, even if I can't make the whole series work, I could make a nice video of Hobbiton and that would be a nice little souvenir for me. We're about to enter Hobbiton. We've all got Ooh. our geek on. <laughs> Plus, if you remember the previous video, I said I only met like two people on the entire nine months who owned a GoPro back then. Well, one of them was a Nook. So a Nook and Michelle were making a little video. I just wanted to sneak out and get into one of those uh, houses. I'm not sure if you're supposed to do oh. that. <laughs> and so we helped each other out with the filming and had like a good laugh going around Hobbiton together. Got to break into Sam's house. Hobbit security game. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly got thrown out there. <laughs> Cheers! Cheers. <laughs> so that gave me some encouragement, like we got something in the bag there, and then after that we had the Maury evening. <laughs> and again had a great time in the group, we managed to get some fun moments on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I just put your injury on the film. Oh. That's what you did. That's what you did. <laughs> and then we did the skydive. That automatically makes great video. And then when the Kiwi bus got stuck in the snow, like everyone wanted to see the video clip afterwards. Like, oh, did you manage to get it? Like, how did it look and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> 
And I think the fact that we spent two to three weeks with this group rather than just two to three days, they kind of got more comfortable around the camera and sort of got into it more. How do you feel there after Good your work. performance? <sighs> Terrible. <laughs> it's all quiet, no one's seen James for a while. <laughs> oh, there he is. Hey! And best of all was our guide, Andrea, and she was really great. And there'd be times when we'd be driving like through the mountains and she'd get on the microphone like, Carl, get down in front of the bus, you gotta get this bit on film. The South Island buses are easier though because they're just like giant go-karts. <laughs> So everyone on the bus, without realizing they were doing it, actually gave me the kick up the ass that I needed to sort of get back in the groove of making the video. Look at James' hand, just got shakes. If I look at the video now, I kind of say that it gets better as it goes through, as I sort of get my mojo back, if you like. And the result was not just my favorite episode, but probably the episode I'm most proud of, of the entire series. Something like the Franz Josef Glacier experience is probably my favourite scene of all of HK2 and Y. You are the third group to ever have gone through this tunnel. It's amazing. And the footage I got in Milford Sound I'm really proud of and it's such a gorgeous place. And I love the stuff of the bungee jump as well because everyone who does the bungee jump gets the video of them going ah, falling off. But because we were making our video, you guys get to see the whole experience. And the worst part of it is the waiting around and the build up. And so when it comes to editing it, it's just so much fun cranking up the tension. Oh my god! <laughs> Absolutely breaking it! jump thing that was a test for me like, it was always I want to do it but I don't want to do it that feeling of just letting go the adrenaline you get from me is just like insane <laughs> how you be do I recommend it Yes, do I recommend it? No. Should you do it? Yes. Should you do it? No. Just jump. <laughs>
when we went snowboarding, that was my first time ever snowboarding, but you'd been before. So we were on the beginner slopes, but you went up on the chairlift and went properly up. Yeah, I think just purely for you, if you could have got up to the top of the mountain and seen that view, you would have really appreciated it. That's the only reason I got the photo. So, yeah. like, I didn't, you, no, I don't, you know me, I don't care about getting the photo. Yeah. And I was like, Carl would love this. So it was kind of like tough to piss you off and have to go, oh, mate, learn to snowboard and then we, then you can go and see this shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's like half the sweetest thing you've ever done and half a fuck you. <laughs> yeah, it was exactly that thing. We landed in South America and it almost felt like a reset on the entire trip because we got from this huge group to suddenly <laughs> Back to just the two of us. They like, start today was freezing, and they warned us that today was gonna be really cold, so we should like rent some gear and get some stuff. So James high bought class, some gloves, high class quality gloves. How much they cost you? Five pound. Five pound. We quickly realised we made a terrible mistake by not learning any Spanish before we got there. And I make a sort of joke about it in the video, but I kind of wish I didn't because, you know, you should never celebrate ignorance and um, we definitely, definitely messed up by not learning any Spanish. We immediately started trying to learn just some basic Spanish phrases, just not to be rude, you know. And you pick up some other words along the way, like on the second day I went to the supermarket to buy a few things, and I wanted to buy some water because we were feeling pretty dehydrated, and they had con gas and sin gas, and I knew basically one meant still and one meant sparkling, but I didn't know which was which. I had a 50-50 chance of getting it right. I tried shaking them to see if any bubbles came up, nothing happened. So I was like, all right, let's, let's try con gas. Bought it. Walked outside of the supermarket, opened it, went <laughs> sprayed all over me, and I was like, oh, okay, so con means with. There's a new word. And I didn't actually film anything in Santiago because we were just in this sort of jet lagged haze for the short time we were there. But yeah, we took the bus journey into Argentina, and generally the bus journeys in South America, you're talking like 20, 22 hour bus journeys. They were long, long journeys, but the buses were super comfy, had really good seats, and the roads were good quality, so it wasn't like Southeast Asia where you're bumping around and it's just like you can't get any rest at all. So we wanted to kickstart our time in South America by uh, doing some activities, doing a trek. So we paid to do this tour to the highest peak in South America. We drove all the way from Chile to Mendoza. Oh, and then the next day, and then the next day that you made us pay more money than the bus ticket from Chile to Mendoza to go halfway back. The bus route we're taking is actually the route we drove here from Chile. So we basically paid to, to go backtrack. halfway back. <laughs> yeah, and sit on the bus again. The woman at the hostel, she sold us it on like this deck. But I don't think people really understand. 27 quid from Chile, from Santiago to Mendoza. Yeah. And we've just paid 29 pounds. We were sold. You, we were sold you. The we, we you so, did that. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. We were so. But you wanted to go to the highest mountain. We'd already been to the highest mountain. We just we didn't, didn't know, know that. that. We didn't know that. So yeah. Carl made us drive. That wasn't my fault. Eight, eight hours back the way we came <laughs> to take a photo, and it was so icy we couldn't even do the hike. Was it like an hour and a half, two hour trek? Two hour trek. You can see people walking it somewhere. Yeah. Not us. <laughs> We're not allowed to do it. So we just got straight back on the bus. See, any time anything the... went wrong in the trip, it was like, Carl made us do this. <laughs> Even <He> did. though... <laughs> I didn't want to do that. Anyway. All right then, I take it all back. We both agreed to do that trip. Which is true. <laughs> I can smell the alcohol. <laughs> Smells like wine. Smells like wine. <laughs> swirl it, swirl it. Oh. Ooh, now I can smell all the fruits and the, the romance. It's not caramelly from the oak. <laughs> the vanilla. <laughs> Buffalo. Buffalo, did you? Yeah. Oh, popcorn. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. No. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Bollocks. <laughs> <laughs>
I remember the hostel in Mendoza and they had an evening on when they brought all like the three hostels together and had all these benches laid out and everyone sitting around chatting and it was like all you can eat pizza. Overall it was a pretty civilized evening until it got to 11 p.m. and then they cleared out all the benches, you know, put on like the disco lights and then they had free tequila at the bar for half an hour and you've never seen a bar transform so quickly from like just civilized chit chat to full on mayhem party. When we got to Buenos Aires, we didn't actually really film anything. Like, we had a great time there. We made friends with a group of Chileans at the hostel. And we just had a few days of hanging out and just taking it easy. But there wasn't like a sort of event or activity or thing to film. We were just kind of hanging out and having a good time. But it's a city I should hopefully get back to in the next couple of years and sort of properly explore it and get on film. Honestly, saying this is one of the things I've been most looking forward to on this trip. <laughs> it's gonna be so good. I, the entire trip you showed me when you went, this is my map of everything I wanted to do. I was like, that is what I want to see. The expectations were like. The man who likes waterfalls. That's <laughs> a, a bit of a, bit of a semi on right now. <laughs> you walk along that deck to Devil's Vote, you can start hearing it getting louder and louder and louder. We had high expectations, but it just completely blew them away. And uh, the woman working the hostel, she gave us great advice. She said, like, well, as soon as you get there, take like, the little train thing to the far end, I think it's to the devil's throat, and then work your way back. It's like a theme park, isn't it? Yeah. Quite a full yeah. theme park. Because everyone just kind of gets into the park and works their way across it. So if you get in and go to the far end and work your way back, you avoid all the big crowds all day. And it worked out perfectly. There's the best thing you've ever seen. The only reason you go to the Brazil side is to get a good photo. Yeah. You go to the Argentine side to get the experience. I love the way the platforms are designed. Just walking amongst them instead of pass around. You're just surrounded by it, aren't you? Like waterfalls and rivers. I recommend doing both because both were amazing. But if you really want to experience the Brazil Falls, you need to go to Argentina. You know, I often get asked, like, what's your favorite beach in the world, or what's the best hostel you've been? And, you know, I just don't really go around traveling, making lists, ranking things. But having said that, Iguazu Falls is the best waterfall in the world, hands down. It's just unbelievable. It's still up there, it's the best thing that I've ever seen. Crossing the border into Brazil, I remember like we just started to learn a few Spanish phrases and then you get to Brazil, it's like, oh God, gotta start again with Portuguese. Well, we had a fantastic time there and it's a country I think we're both dying to go back to and explore loads more of. What we like about traveling to South America compared to Southeast Asia is you only get one ticket. Instead of 50 tickets or 50 tickets, one ticket. In fact, sometimes you don't even need a ticket, they go you just... You don't even need to know if you're supposed to get on that boat, you just get on the boat. Yeah, so much easier, so much better. I remember Ila Grande when we did that day boat tour and we had the guide, Buddha. He was a really fun, friendly bloke from Switzerland and it was a great day out. But I remember when we went off for a walk in the jungle and then we came back to the boat and most of our beers had been drunk whilst we were away and he was just off his head. And now we start the surf contest! <laughs> so we're just kind of wondering like, are we gonna make it back okay? Before we take the break, we take okay, just in case we smoke some bass, I'm too cool to go to school, I'm too black to go back, we are more needed than horses. <laughs> We 
We were so lucky that our friend Kalila was in town visiting her friend Aisa because she basically just unlocked Rio for us. So there you can see Copacabana Beach and there is the restaurant where we had lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Deep history of Sugarloaf Mountain. <laughs> You know, getting to go into what was apparently the most dangerous favela in Rio and then getting interviewed on the radio station was just one of the most random experiences of the entire nine months. My friend and I are traveling around the world, so we came to just see what Brazil's like. And yeah, I love Brazil as well. <laughs> We didn't go to one of those fake favela parties that, you know, you can pay to go to a hostel. This was going to the favelas, and that was because Aisa's mom was a volunteer. She was contributing to them. She was helping them. She was using her privilege to help the unprivileged. I remember being very specific with her saying like tell me when I can film and when I can't because yeah like, all right they're telling us they're taking us somewhere dangerous and I'm there you know wanting to make my video but I you know don't want to jeopardize it I think so I was like I was very like let me know when yeah, I, I can film and when I can't I don't think we appreciated like how dangerous it was it wasn't until we were driving out. Once we got to the border of the favela, Aisa's mum stopped the car and she was like praying to say thank you that we got out okay. And we were like, oh shit, maybe it was more dangerous than we realized. She said that uh, every time she goes up, she pray to Praise God. To God, I got that, yeah. Wind <laughs> down your window so you don't get shot. Then you get in the car and there's bullet holes everywhere. But the way the people in the favela is treating us, hey, oh my God, you guys are from Europe? Do you want to come on our radio? No. Get the fuck out of our favelas now before we shoot you. Yeah. They're not nasty people. They're people in difficult times who have found a way to try and grow a community. She's saying what that the saying? radio, the goal of this radio is like to give like communication for all kind of people. Mm -hmm. So he really wants the people to get listen to this one because they give information about the community. So it's like inside information. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. every single country I've been to, what you learn when you travel, the majority of people are good. And yeah, that might sound like a very simplistic thing to say, but it's easy to forget when you're stuck inside and you're just doom scrolling all day on Twitter and you just say, God, the world's full of a bunch of dicks. But once you actually get out into the world, you realize the opposite of that is true. But yeah, I just sorted everything out and took us to all these cool spots, these great restaurants. And then she knew a guy around the paragliding, and that was so much fun. Tell me about the football game we went to. So it's like the biggest derby in Rio. It was Flamengo versus Fluminense, the flu flag, I think that's what they call it. The World Cup Stadium, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Went to the stadium, we managed to get tickets. All of a sudden, we sat there realizing, and it's like, oh, guys, sign this beer? Oh, this is amazing. Why isn't anyone buying the beer? There's three of us. We, we walk around each and we're drinking it. And you were going, this tastes like shit. I was like, yeah, but at least we can drink in a stadium. Second or third goal went in. And the guy went run into the corner and slid on his knees and celebrated. And in front of where he slid, he went, bravo, zero, zero, zero. And I looked at it and I looked at you and I was like, Carl, pretty sure that beer has got no alcohol in it. And then you looked at the can and it's just like, big, we're, zero, zero, zero. And I was like, we're, we're basically basically holding the can all the way. <laughs> if we could only see Brava and we're going, boom. And then we just turn the can around to see a giant zero. And we're like, oh. So it's like, and I was like, Carl, like, I'm so glad. I did not drink any more of that. O desvio vai sobrar, vem o chute cruzado do Gabriel, furou o Fred, tem chance do Flamengo, a bola entrando!
getting to Peru and doing that G Adventures tour was actually quite a nice treat for us because we spent like over the last six months just staying in hostels and dorm beds and suddenly to have like a twin private room that you get with those tours. It was like, wow, this is like proper luxury. Kitted out for the trip. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looks like a wig. <laughs> it's not very comfortable. As we were traveling through the Sacred Valley to get towards the start of the Inca Trail, like some of the places we went to were just so epic, and it was that was a really cool time. I think both James and I had this feeling of like, wow, we were just so far away from home and just so far into this trip and just. It's another crazy, amazing place. And uh, yeah, we're just, again, just loving life at this point. <sighs> Made it to the top of the crown. Just a little drop. Hang on all the way down there. Good job the wind's blowing us right off. You see them hugging the wind. Holding on to this <laughs> Yeah, I'm afraid of heights, but <laughs> been a couple of moments. There's some times I was like, I can't, can't go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can be the guinea pig. Did the Inca Trail is like probably the first big hike I've ever. Well, it was the first big hike I've ever done in my life. Not that I was worried about it, but turned up in my Vans trainers, a little backpack, everyone else is geared up with like hiking sticks and walking boots, and I'm like. Like, aren't we just going for a walk? <laughs> yeah, and also some I think of it's going to be all right. I think it's going to be fine. See, once we got going on this little walk, the first bit was hard, but once you got going, it was supposed all right. to take us what an hour and a half. It's taking us twenty minutes. Fucking awesome. You excited, Percy? Super, ready to start this beautiful trip. Nice. Let's go. Okay, my dear friend. First of all, I would like to tell you, welcome to this Inca trail. We are. To be able to enjoy the nature, to be able to enjoy this beautiful experience, you need to open a little bit more your heart and your mind. Uh, but now we've got to set up on our tent for the night. I really loved the first evening of the trek where we sort of got to chat to the porters and get to know them a bit. When I started sleep on. Oh, I see. <laughs> they speak mainly Quechua, but some of the younger ones, they speak Spanish. My name is Pedro, I'm coming from Ollanta y Tambo. I have, she said, sorry, I have only two children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I asked, are you planning to have more children? She said, only one more, he said. And that's one of those moments that's just really hard to get unless you're on a tour because you wouldn't get to meet them and you wouldn't have someone translating for you. So that was really special. I'm asking, what are you going to do to don't have more kids in the future? <laughs> yeah, he said, probably I'm going to sleep in another bed. <laughs> Percy's explained one thing you should always remember is always look back from where you came from. Whenever you go hiking, the view in front of you, it might be amazing, but if you just turn around and take the time to take the moment to look back and you see where you've come from, you'll see something that might even be better. But also that just applies in like sort of life, just think about all the stuff that, wow, I'm here. Look, look how I got here. So it's that's stuck with me forever. It's almost like you wanted us to do a retrospective video, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Percy was such a nice guy and so passionate about what he was doing, but also he kept saying, like, you know, you guys to me, you're not you're not friends, you're not gringos, you're not customers, you're a family. We're gonna be a family for these few days. From this moment, I would like to call you a family. And the cynical side of the start singing, ah, oh, that's nice, but yeah, sure, whatever. But then, you know, by the penultimate night of the trip, before we actually got to Machu Picchu, and everyone just starts sharing these stories about their lives and people were crying. And I was just sitting there thinking, holy shit, he did it, you know? This moment, as I told you last night, this one always gonna be here.
First of all, I would like to tell you, welcome to Machu Picchu. Tell to your friends, tell to your relatives, go to Machu Picchu, follow the Inca Trail. Because do you think it's the best way? Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> not, it's not the best way, it's the only way. <laughs> it's the only way to come to this place. The Peru episode could have actually been two episodes if our time in the Amazon hadn't got cut short because our plane got cancelled and so we only had two days one night there rather than the three days. So if we had that full amount of time there, I could have fleshed out to a different episode. But because we were there only for a short time, it would have been like one really long episode on the Inca Trail and one really short episode in the Amazon. So it wouldn't have really worked. So it is a bit disjointed having the two of them together, but it's just because our time got cut short there. Finally got our first wild crocodile slash alligator. <laughs> you shit yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're a dick, man. <laughs> Watch out for the log, huh? <laughs> well, before to start with this night walk, my main recommendation is don't touch anything. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> okay, this one, right? What? One Take this spider. This is spider. It's cool. Jumping is fun. Okay, see you later. <laughs> the night walk in the Amazon was one of the unexpected highlights of the trip for me. It was just magical. This is a nice caterpillar. You see? We didn't even walk that far, you just walk in slowly and looking carefully to see what little animals and insects you can discover. Yeah. How long do you say the snake is? Two, two and a half meters. Two and a half meters. The one thing I didn't expect to see was a walking tree. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know they existed. They can walk. They can move. They walk. The trees walk. Cheers, my friends. You're actually making it to Cheers. the jungle. To the jungle. Cheers. Central America is one of those places I hadn't put much thought into before the trip. We just had to change planes there on the way from Peru up to LA. Feeling my way through the darkness. So I thought, all right, let's go check out Panama and Costa Rica. And when I started doing research about Panama, the one thing that kept coming up was you have to go to the San Blas Islands. So wake me up. It's not actually the easiest place to film San Blas. Like, it's beautiful. It's like dictionary definition of paradise with the islands and stuff. But in terms of storytelling, you're not actually doing much. You're just sort of lazing around, enjoying being in paradise, which is fun for us. But for the viewer, it's like, all right, we get it. You know, move on. <laughs> Costa Rica is one of those countries we kind of skipped through really because it's a lot more expensive than the rest of Central America and we only had a limited budget left and we still had the big US road trip to do. When we got to La Fortuna, they had like all these activities you can do, but a lot of them we'd already done on the trip. And so we're like, oh, well, we've hiked volcanoes, we've done whitewater rafting, we've done bungee jumps, but we did have our time cut short on the Amazon, so why don't we go and do the nature park tour here? Continuing your tradition of trying to pick up animals. <laughs> Stop being so brave, we away. There we go. And in Nicaragua, we weren't even planning on going to, but everyone was just like, oh, it's cheap as fuck up there, and there's this huge party on every Sunday. You gotta go check it out. So, yeah, we just like, all right, got on a bus and went up there. So the country count went up from 19 to 20 as we went up to Nicaragua for Sunday fun day. Yeah, baby! They're from America, by the way. <laughs> yeah. 
See the injury? <laughs> so I dive in. Such a good dive. I face planted at the bottom of the pool. <laughs> That hostel, the Naked Tiger, was like, yeah, one of the best in the world. It was so good. Good decision to come to Nicaragua, eh? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a great time. Look at these colors. We're just saying we live such a stressful life. <laughs> <laughs> The final leg of the trip, driving from LA to New York, was probably where I messed up the planning of the trip the most. I didn't put that much effort into planning it because I was like, oh, I know America so well, know like the back of my hand that it's so easy traveling around there, so we don't need to focus too much on it beforehand, it'll be fine when we get there. It's James's first time to America, but it's my 13th, and I didn't want to be doing the same stuff over again. Because on previous trips I'd travelled around the national parks to death, I wanted to focus on the cities in the deep south. Now the fundamental flaw with that plan is because we were just doing one city after another from city to city to city, like during the week these places were pretty dead because it's not like some other backpacking destinations where the day of the week is irrelevant. Here it's like this is where people live and work so you show up on a Monday and there's no one out, there's nothing going on, it's all pretty quiet. Last night when James was playing poker I started chatting to this, this guy next to me, uh, this middle aged guy, he works in packaging so that was fun. <laughs> Because there's not many hostels or backpacking infrastructure, you can't just show up at a place and there's a big list of things to do. Like, we'd be staying in motels, and the only pamphlets are sort of like for family days out, not things we were really interested in. Our plan was to stay at a hostel so we could meet lots of people and go out on the pub crawls that they organized. But we got there and it was absolutely dead. There was no one there. So a week or two into it, we thought, you know what, let's just scrap this plan and let's go check out the national parks and do some outdoorsy adventure stuff that we prefer doing. But then this happened. Breaking news, it is now midnight. The U.S. government has officially shut down. 800,000 federal workers will stay home today without pay. National parks like Yosemite are shuttered. So everything we wanted to do was basically shut. And so we were kind of stuck going from one city to another. And I remember getting up every morning, sort of researching my iPad, things to do. And I think just because we were at the end of the trip and we were kind of a bit burnt out and feeling a bit tired and lazy, just nothing really kind of grabbed our attention. Did you know the French pirate Jean Lafitte and his brother based smuggling operations on this waterway in the early 1800s? I didn't know that car. Oh, now you do. Now we do. And I'm sure if we were to go back and do the exact same road trip again and research it properly, we could have a far better experience and see and do loads of different things. But how we were feeling at that point of the trip, we needed things put on the plate and they weren't. Plus, half the stuff was shut down as well. Well, the excitement continues on our American trip. <laughs> <laughs> we get here and the sampler tour is sold out. So we're gonna do our own tour. We're gonna do our own tour of the town. It ended up just being like this weird road trip of kind of going from one crazy golf course to another, which was fun. We still had fun. It just wasn't as fulfilling as the rest of the trip. So I won. I got nice points. Yep. Winner. There were some exceptions. Like we got to Austin and there's a good hostel there and had all these recommendations of these things you could do, but they were like a one or two or three hour drive away. And we'd just been driving for two whole days through the desert to get to Austin. The last thing we wanted to do was hop back in the car, so we just went to the bars and hung out and had a good time. Which again, fun for us, but doesn't make a good video. I remember we got to Houston, we tried to go to a water park and it was shut for winter. So Houston's been a success, would we say, Carl? Houston, we had a problem. <laughs> we had a problem in Houston. Failure. And we were like, it was hotter than the hottest day it gets in the summer in the UK. We're like, how can it be shut, you know? But we went to Galveston Park, had a great laugh there. That was really good fun. He doesn't like shrimp. And so the wager is for 20 bucks and he's going to eat it. Come on, James. 20 American dollars. <laughs> Can I say on behalf of Bubba Gum Shrimp that I, I thought it was delicious. I thought it was delicious, so well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank James, you. however. Yeah, I love it. He had the best part of it. 
well, that's probably going to happen, and it did. We got pulled over by the police for speeding. But the first guy let us off because we showed him our passport. It's like showing a kid a shiny toy. And then the second guy was like from the Terminator. Have you seen this boy? Ah! My uh, driver's license uh, says Newport, South Wales. So uh, he put Newport, Orange County, <laughs> which I think is in California. <laughs> uh, this time we didn't get so lucky. <laughs> now I have to go to court on the 26th of November in Mississippi. And um, what date did we leave America? Uh, Third of November. So I rang up the court and explained my court date's next week. There's no way I could make it. And the woman on the end of the phone went, oh my God, I love your accent. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you all don't have to worry about coming to court. <laughs> I think it was just like, it went, that's going to be too much work. Just we'll throw that one yeah. out. <laughs> After our first night in Chicago, you were sleeping in, so I went down to the basement lounge to wait for you to, <laughs> for to come up, like to come get me for the day out. And then I popped back up to the room and realized you're in the shower. It's like, oh, I'll just go wait in the lounge again. Half an hour later, you still hadn't showed up, so I went back up and you'd gone out. And basically, you thought I'd gone out for the day in a huff, and so I thought you'd gone out for the day in a huff. And so I was just like, why didn't he fucking come and check down the lounge? But Neither of us had working phones as well, so we couldn't just text each other to sort of go, where are you? Uh, so my day out in Chicago is funny. I don't know what cars it's like. <laughs> the tallest building is the Hancock building, I think it is. Anyway, I decided to go to the bar. Next, you know, there's two girls sat next to me and they're like drinking champagne and stuff. They heard me talking to the barman and I was like, all right, you all right, mate, can I get a beer, please? And they're like, Oh my God, where are you from? <laughs> it was like, ah, oh, from England, you know. And like, what are you doing in Chicago? It's like, ah, oh, just been traveling around the world for nine months. They're like, what? It's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> as, you as, as you do. Like, And they're like, my friend just got engaged. Look at the ring. Shows us this massive rock diamond. I'm like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Congratulations. I'm really happy for you. She's like, oh my God. If I wasn't engaged, I'd so do you right now. <laughs> do you want to have a drink with us? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they ordered another bottle of champagne. And like, fiance eventually turns up. They invite me to the wedding. <laughs> I was like, nah, I'm leaving. Like, I'll be gone by then. <laughs> When you got back and told me everything that happened. And then the next day, you're like, all right, I'm just going to chill out. I was like, right, I'm going to go on my own adventure the next day. I went <laughs> the exact same route, went to the exact same bar. Nothing of interest happened. <laughs> no matter where you go in the world, there's always a guy playing pan pipes trying to sell CDs. I think in, you know, hindsight's 2020 and all that, but I think given what we were enjoying doing and the experiences we enjoyed having on the overall trip, um, it would have actually just been better if we stayed in Central America and worked our way up to Cancun and finished there. You know, Hong Kong to Cancun might not have the same ring to it and stuff like that, but I think for where we were and what we are doing, that would have been better. But I like the stuff towards the end of the episode, like when we get to Toronto and I sort of meet up with my mate Matt, and then we have this sort of reunion there, that stuff's really good, I really like that bit. When you look back on this video, when you're piggybacking me and we're hugging and stroking each other's faces. <laughs> I went <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll get you there, Frodo. <laughs> Frodo and Sam. <laughs> I'm so glad when we got to Niagara Falls, we took the advice from the guy around the hostel and we did slow down and spend two days there because that was really nice. <laughs> Thank you.
say goodbye to Dodge Avenger. Took Thank us, you. took Thank us over, well. took us over 5,000 miles, quite slowly. <laughs> but, yeah. We had a few nights in New York when we got there and we decided on the first day just to sort of smash out as many touristy sites as possible, leaving the rest of our time there free to just kind of hang out and explore and just see some random things. Five Points is this legendary place where all the graffiti eyes go and just tag their work. It was absolutely amazing because I love my street art and literally a week later the developers painted all over all that graffiti artwork. We were fortunate enough to just be able to see it a week before it disappeared. And I remember we had to stay in one of those shitty, bland, hostling international hostels because everywhere else was fully booked because that weekend we were there was like the New York Marathon and it was Halloween, so New York was just rammed. <laughs> And I did actually film a few little moments from the Halloween parade because I met up with my cousin who was living there at the time. In New York, I got my cousin here. Hey, Hello. Ben. Hello. Hello. How's it going? And my brother was even in town for work, but they didn't make the edit because it was just some random little bits and pieces. Didn't really tell a story. Just a quiet night in New York. Yeah. Too busy. Not too busy, right? <laughs> Johnny Darko. Good work. Miscellaneous werewolf. Good work. <laughs> Plus, from an overall story perspective, like thematically, yeah, you want to just finish it with me and James just hanging out. And we're in that McSorley, it's like the oldest pub in New York. Thanks, man. Cheers. It's the only bar that didn't change even for the permission. Only legal bar in the whole of America because it only had a beer license, not a full liquor license. And now you get a mixture of fat boys who enjoy the 150 ale, or a guy who is out in entertainers desperate to grab on something real in today's plastic coated but culture. That's pretty much us. <laughs> And it's fun just chilling in that old historic place and chatting to a few people and just, yeah, just hanging out. We decided we were only going to stay for one. What's this now? Six? Six. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we saw the Statue of Liberty from afar, but it was $28 to go see it, so. I'd rather do $28 in a bar. It's got more history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For the last week or two of the trip, James was getting a bit down because it was all coming to an end. Whilst I was trying to stay positive, you know, I was sort of, oh, let's soak up these last few moments, you know. Plus, I had that joint birthday celebration with my mum to look forward to when I got back, and I was going to get to meet my niece for the first time. Gone for the sweet thing, got just become an uncle, baby has me. Uncle for the first time. She was born when I was in Kopang Yang, and she was now eight months old. So I was just focusing on that. But the problem with that, by staying all positive, was I hadn't sort of mentally prepared myself for getting home. And so, when we did land and my mum picked me up in the car, I remember just sitting there and it was like a sucker punch to the gut. Like the biggest come down ever. Like, oh god, it's over. You know? I'd spent all those years building, planning, dreaming about this trip. Then I've been living the dream and now it's over. And I was like, well, now what? You know? I'm sure anyone who's watching this is going to be crying me an absolute river right now. Like, oh, you went on the trip of a lifetime and then you had to come home? Oh, your life is so hard. But yeah, it was a big come down. And that, for that first week at home, I was just like a deer in headlights. Just like, it just felt so weird being back. Like everything felt strange because, you know, people often say time flies when you're having fun, but it's the opposite when you're traveling. It feels way longer because, when you're at home doing the 9 to 5, you do have those days in the office where you're like watching the clock and it's going so slow and you're like, oh, come on. But actually time does fly by way quicker because you've got nothing to measure your life by. It all just blurs into one. Whilst when you go away, whether it's two days, two weeks, two months or nine months or a year, it feels way longer because you're filling every day with new experiences and new adventures. 
so the nine months didn't skip by. It felt like we'd been away for almost like nine years rather than nine months. So he started looking for all the passwords. Like, damn, don't you guys work? <laughs> we were like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we both managed to get new work sorted pretty quickly when we got back and then after a couple of weeks of being home I was like right shit. I better start trying to edit this video and uh, Remember plugging in the hard drive and loading it in the editing software and I saw that clip of us at Heathrow Airport right at the start of the trip Hi, mate. How are you feeling? Not bad mate <laughs> you Nervous? Nervous and excited <laughs> And that felt like a lifetime ago. Seriously, it goes back to what I was saying about it feeling a lot longer than nine months. That felt like such a long time ago. Um, how did you feel when you got to Heathrow today? Felt a little bit out of my depth. Don't really know what to expect. Furious I've ever been. I think it's Croatia or Hungary, whichever one's through <laughs> away. And I remember it being so weird seeing James look like that because, you know, James had had that same haircut pretty much the entire 10 years that I knew him. But during the trip, he sort of let his hair grow and stuff like that. So I was used to like the, the new James, you know, and then just seeing that clip, I was like, oh my God, it was, it was the weirdest, weirdest feeling. You've done this before? Um, I do a video of every single trip. Um, this one's gonna take longer to edit. It's gonna be nine months of footage. And as I mentioned, I had this self-doubt throughout the trip that I hadn't filmed enough and that we didn't have enough material to sort of make a video, but I put it into the editing program, started going through it, and I was like, wait a minute, I think I can make this work. I think we've got enough here, you know? Everything looks walking distance. So I don't know. Settle down. And have a little wandering time, I reckon. Yeah. And people ask, well, how the hell do you edit nine months worth of footage? It's not like you get nine months worth of footage, put up on a massive timeline, and start trying to sort it out. You just sort of organize it by country, then you organize it by place, then you organize it by activity, then you start breaking it down to like the key moments from that, and you get it all and bring it down to these tiny moments. And then you start building it back up again and start telling the story. So I started editing it in November 2013 and the final episode didn't come out till the end of December 2014 so you're talking like nearly 13 months to edit the entire series but that wasn't editing non-stop every day I had a full-time job so it was like editing and lunch breaks and evenings and weekends you know so I don't know how long it actually was in actual time <laughs> But one of the things that was really helpful at work was my buddy Matt, who I met up with in Barry when I was on the trip. This is my hometown. Go fucking diss it. <laughs> this is where I'm from. Every Friday, sort of late Friday afternoon, we'd be sitting in the office just having a couple of beers, and I'd be like, oh, do you want to see the latest of what I've cut from the trip? If you end up editing this and making fun of my hometown, <laughs> I will kill you, Carl. I will kill you. I love it here. <laughs> And Matt was so great and so useful at giving feedback because the hard thing about when you make a travel video is everything in it is interesting to you but what part of your experience is interesting to other people that's the hard thing to judge and it takes a while to sort of figure out and learn and by showing the episodes as I was cutting them to Matt he was so great at giving feedback and he was like really encouraging like oh dude this bit's great this is really working and then other bits would be going like i don't understand what's going on here you need to explain it better or this bit's dragging on too long or this bit's not funny you have to be there or sorry i know he's your friend but i can't understand the freaking word that guy's saying you need to subtitle him so you've been a great group guys thanks for coming out and playing with us Yay! And James, obviously having been on the trip, was also great at giving feedback and giving me ideas and stuff. He's often like, where's my credit, bitch? But um, I remember when I showed him the first three episodes, uh, it was really great, it was really satisfying to sort of see sort of the big grin on his face he had when he was watching it. That was really cool. I couldn't believe it. I basically, I, I had no idea. Like, it was just like an absolute relief to watch the video and go, wow, 
This is brilliant. There's one moment, the sort of raft sequence of us in Yang Xiao with the guide singing the song. Um, I had this shot of a cow, and I remember when I filmed it, James was making fun of me. Like, if you hear the original audio, he's like, mate, why are you filming a cow? It's a cow car. <laughs> we have down here, yeah. back in Europe, right? I know, this one. He it's just a cow. He, <laughs> fil he filmed us crossing the road the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, it is special. You don't see that in the UK, right? I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Skip forward 12 months later and I'm showing James the episode and there's like the whole scene's cut together, the guy's singing the song, got all the nice scenery and then there's this shot of a cow and it just zooms out and the reflection of the cow and the reflection of like the mountains behind him. And James's like, oh that's a really good shot. I was like, right you prick. And I pressed pause, like, do you know what you said to me when I was filming that? Like, I told you to trust me. Oh, yeah! Yeah! <laughs> awesome. I do remember that though, when there was like bits when you go on like, oh, did you not get that? Or did you not get that? And I was thinking, you spent nine months moaning about me filming every day. <laughs> and now you're going, why isn't this in the video? It's like, yeah. why, did why, you don't you this? why didn't you film this bit? Because you told me to F him, don't film this. <laughs> <laughs> And throughout the series, I was just using copyrighted music because, you know, again, I didn't think anyone was going to watch it. I keep saying this, but it's true, I didn't. And so I was like, well, I'll just use whatever music I want. It's my little pet project, so I'll just use whatever tracks I like. You know, I want to use all the Lord of the Rings music in New Zealand, so I'm going to do it. And some people asked us, oh, how did you get away with using copyrighted music? And I'm like, we didn't, you know, so they're all monetized for the copyright owners. And some of the episodes got blocked and taken down. Like I had to re-upload the Thailand episode and the USA one, putting in new tracks. But when it came time to finalizing the series, I was like, right, I've got copyrighted music throughout, but I want this series to have its own theme and have its own identity. I don't want to just use some other film music or some other piece of music anyone else can use. I want it to have its own unique theme. And so I messaged my mate Jack and he's an incredible musician and composer and we've been friends for quite a few years so I knew we had similar tastes in music like we've been to see Hans Zimmer together and stuff like that. And I said to him, would you be interested in creating a theme for this series? Now remember the, the brief I gave you, it's like it has to work on two levels. It has to work um, as like when you hear it just on the piano, it has to like pull those nostalgia strings and make you go, oh, like, um, but then it also has to work as a full and epic um, superhero theme. A strong melody should probably work in both those scenarios, which is which is what you asked me to do. You know, asking you to create this theme, and when you first sent it through to me, which was basically just the piano bit, and then the drums came in. But I was so nervous before I hit play because I was like, if it's bad, I can just say it's bad. But I was worried it's going to be like good, but just not quite good enough, and I'm going to have like a really awkward conversation of like, you know, thanks but no thanks, Jack. But then I hit play. Then my editor, we I listened to, it, I went, yes, that's it. That's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> The interesting thing about the theme is, and I don't think we've even ever sp spoken about this, so this, this, <laughs> may be, this may be a surprise, I'm not sure, but um, every, every melody that I've done for you has has lyrics, it has, it has something that I would sing to it. If you can sing it and if you can say it, it's a, it, it the phrasing is there for it in terms of, in terms of the rhythmical phrasing is there for it to be memorable i i think so it is literally hong kong hong kong new york <laughs> that's brilliant so whenever i'm I, whenever if, if i listen to it or i'm working on hong kong hong kong new york oh, that's awesome oh, i can imagine that some drunken backpacker's going to come up singing that to me in a hostel at some point <laughs> <laughs> We've been planning and saving for this trip for a few years now and basically me and my mate James are going to quit our jobs and go travel around the world for nine months. 
And so it finally became time to release the series and I released it one episode a week from September 2014 to December 2014. And we're gonna take just one camera and film everything. This trip is way bigger than anything I've ever done before. My longest holiday, two weeks I think. It still hasn't really sunk in the scale of what we're doing. And it was doing all right, like we're getting great feedback. People said they really enjoyed it. And you know, friends and family were watching it and people we met on the trip were watching it, but it wasn't really taking off yet. And then a few months in, I changed the title of the episodes on YouTube because originally it just said in the text, HK2MY EP3 Thailand, which is just meaningless to anyone. And I just changed it to HK2MY EP3 Backpacking in Thailand. And that just sorted out the SEO for Google. And so suddenly, people who were searching backpacking in Thailand could find these videos. And YouTube was recommending these videos to everyone because they're long videos and people are watching it all the way through, liking, commenting, and then watching the next one. So that tells the algorithms and YouTube and whatever that it's good, so they recommend it to other people. And slowly but surely, it just gradually began to snowball and the views just start going up and up and up. How many? Run very fast, otherwise we fall. Now, I don't want anyone watching this thinking that I'm sitting here acting as if I've created some kind of masterpiece or something because it, it's far from that. And like anything that you create, you're the biggest critic of because you see all the cracks and all the mistakes and all the things you wish you could have done better. So yeah, it's far from perfect, but I think the reason people responded well to the series is one, there wasn't that many videos out there like that about the backpacking experience when we released it. Like, lots of people have mentioned to me about the series, the departures, but I've never seen that, so I can't really speak for that series. Like I keep saying, I was always inspired by the series like Long Way Round and By Any Means. Also, and this is the bit where I pat myself on the back, but yeah, I am an editor, I do it for a living, so I know how to tell a story, you know? We didn't just upload a GoPro montage. But I think the two most important things were, one, we were honest about the travel experience, you know? There's a tendency these days, especially with Instagram, to make traveling seem like some magical utopia where as soon as you step foot on foreign soil, everything's perfect. Life's not like that. When traveling's not like that, it's always a mixture of the good and the bad and the sweet and the sour and everything in between. And you know, you go on an adventure, you don't do the adventure justice if you only show the good stuff. The bus broke down, and now we're stuck in a traffic jam. And the other important thing, and I think this is true across all my travel videos, is we're never behaving any differently when the camera's recording to when the camera's not recording. Like, we're not playing up to the camera, and we're not putting on a show, we're not doing some kind of TikTok dance or anything like that. We're just being ourselves and acting the same way we would do if we weren't making a film. How we found today, then? The average, apart from the waterfall, which was brilliant. In the meantime, as the series began to grow, we started going on other trips. And in our first year back, we were both working full time, so we were just restricted to annual leave. So James went off and did a European road trip. We're in Paris. It's the Eiffel Tower. What this? No. <laughs> That's called the lamppost. <laughs> but I'd seen a lot of Europe growing up, so I wanted to use what little time I had to go somewhere new and epic. And one of the big places that we didn't go to on our trip was the Himalayas. So that led to me doing the Quest for Everest trip with my flatmate, Chris. Just being aware of everything you say is gonna be a bit strange, especially for someone like Carl who shoots his mouth off at literally every opportunity. <laughs> I learned so much about filmmaking from editing the HK to NY series. Not so much from filming it, but from editing it. So it was great to be able to apply all of that to filming the Quest for Everest, and it resulted in videos that I was far more satisfied with. You right? <laughs> I just think that. Plus, it had the bonus of Chris nearly dying, which made great video. It was so good.
Then by March 2015, James had been saving up again for a year and a half to go off on another trip, in which time he'd also got on a sleeve tattoo of all his sort of favourite moments in the different cultures and places and stuff from our hk 2 ny trip. And it looks freaking awesome. <laughs> you know, to think two years ago he'd never been travelling and now he's bought a one-way flight to Cancun. I realised, okay, if I ever go travelling again, I'm not doing it on a time scale. I'm just going to get on a plane and go. So I put the one-way ticket to Mexico and then just basically worked my way all the way down to Argentina. In that 20 months, I didn't have the same budget that I had when we did HK to NY. So I decided to do the trip slightly different. Volunteered in hostels, volunteered in bars. I worked on the San Blas Islands with the indigenous community, learned a lot about their culture, taught backpackers about their culture too. What was the name that the Kunas had for you? Sipu Mumu. Was it translate to? <laughs> the drug white man. <laughs> <laughs> you ready? No, I'm not. No. Oh! Oh! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god, I can't breathe! Earlier on in James's 20 months away, I met up with him to travel through Panama, Colombia, and Venezuela, which became the Backpackers of the Caribbean trip. I said to James, that's gonna be epic diving into the sunset. <laughs> And knowing that James likes to travel slower, I was like, we could probably smash out this trip in four weeks, so let's do seven. And that's pretty much what we always do now when we do a trip together, is like, if I think I can do it this time, I just double the length of the trip to sort of have a compromise between our two styles of traveling. Hurry up, Carl. You're such a dick! Good view. Don't push me. <laughs> <laughs> And I would have loved to have gone with James for the whole of his 20 month trip from the start to the finish, you know, it would have been cool, like, you know, we did it my way last time, let's do it your way this time, take it easy, take it slow, it would have been great. But the reason I didn't go with him is I didn't want to quit a job, leave a flat, go away again and reset again when I come back. I wanted to come up with something more sustainable. And luckily with my line of work of video editing, I can freelance. So I moved to freelance to start of 2015 and then I could just work for a month or two, then go traveling then work a bit more and then go traveling and keep doing that and repeating and gradually just get to see more and more parts of the world and make more films for the YouTube channel. Perfect day to go riding your bike. Altitude's doing us in a bit. Good luck Chris. <laughs> During all this time, the view count for Hong Kong to New York was just growing exponentially. And then I remember on the Backpackers of the Caribbean trip, we actually got recognized for the first time because we were back at the Aqua Lounge in Bocas del Toro, basically doing the exact same thing we were two years ago. And there's these two girls going, wait a minute, we we've seen this before. We've seen you on YouTube. And I was like, oh my God. This is the first time this has ever happened. We just met some random people and they've seen hk 2 ny on YouTube. Oh yes, we have! They inspired us to come here. Amazing video. Inspiration. <laughs> That's fucking amazing. And I still can't do my foot fit. <laughs> and then the next house we went to, this guy Chris came up to us and was like, oh mate, loved the whole series. I was like, oh shit, you know? And it started happening more and more often. I worked with Deeps for a few trips in San Blas and uh, I was joking around to her saying, hey, do you know I'm YouTube famous? And she's like, James, you're not YouTube famous. You're just a scrubber who washes the dishes after everyone eats their food. I was like, Deeps, I'm YouTube famous. Anyway, one of the briefings on San Blas, basically they explained, this is what's going to happen on the tour. This is what you're going to experience. Does anyone have any questions? And uh, a couple of people put their hands up and went, are you James from YouTube? <laughs> and I just looked at Deeps and went, I told you. <laughs> Deeps looked back at me and went, how much did you pay them to say that? And I was like, have we ever met before? No, we, the only reason we're here is because we watched hk 2 And I was like, told you Deeps? And she's like, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And she still doesn't believe it. And she's still not seen any of the videos. <laughs> <laughs> 
It even happened a couple of times in New Zealand in 2017, whilst we were climbing Mount Doom. Isn't this girl a Jemima? We said, oh yeah, I'm a big fan of his. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, before all that shit went down, we did some road trips. And she goes, oh, I know those road trips, you're Matt. It's like, fuck yes, I got recognised for once. <laughs> I got recognised. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and I've been like in the other side of the world in a bar, walking through and someone's like, mate, oh my God, you're the reason I'm traveling. You're the reason I quit my job. I saw your series and you're the reason I'm doing this trip. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, it's just hard to process because we never set out to inspire people, you know? It wasn't like I said to James, come follow me on this noble quest and we'll set out across the world and inspire a generation to travel with our great film that we're gonna make. It was like, nah, let's, let's go traveling because it'll be fun, you know? And let's make a video of it because that'll be fun for me. You know, it'll be a fun creative project. We're having a good time, that's the gist of it. We're having a very, very good time. <laughs> we were doing it for selfish reasons, you know? And I don't mean selfish in a negative way, but we were doing the trip for us just to have fun Fun, have an incredible experience. We never expected that it would set off and become this thing and you know inspire other people to travel. It just um it's it's nuts, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> to New York. Cheers. But we've met so many cool people and made so many cool new friends off the back of the channel that yeah, I love it. Who is your mate? <laughs> <laughs>Another question I get asked a lot is, you know, how did that trip change you? And, you know, I changed a lot more on my first backpacking trip in 2006 because the first time you do it, you just grow in so much confidence and, you know, you push yourself and you get used to meeting new people and experiencing new cultures and all that kind of stuff. So I had a bigger change in 2006 and probably changed less on HK Turn Y, which is probably why I think people relate to James' story more on the trip because you see a bigger change in him throughout the series. People always ask me this, like, in like hindsight, you should bought your house. Well, yeah, it would probably be worth £150,000 more. Would I replace that for the experiences and the memories and the things that, that I did in that nine months? No. Was it worth £150,000 and the rest? It just opened up my eyes to a, a, like a whole different way of life. You don't have to do nine to five. You can find creative jobs like what Carl does, where you can do flipping to a month off, month off, month off, month off. You'll be a digital nomad. There's loads of different ways. I'm still in that routine now. <laughs> but the difference is, my routine now is I work nine to five for six months and then I quit. I quit my job and then I go and travel six months. In the last nine years, I've traveled four and a half years and I've worked four and a half years. That view, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can travel anywhere you want. You can save up all the money and travel in luxury. You can save up no money and enjoy the hitchhike. There is no right or wrong way to travel. And it really frustrates me when people come in and say, oh, you guys didn't do it right. It's like, no, we did it how we wanted to do it. And then I went and did it again, myself, a different way to how me and Carl did it the first time. And I've been away again and done it different again. <laughs> Every time I go traveling, it is different. There is no right or wrong way to do it. Just do whatever you want to do and enjoy it. Simple as that. February 10th to March 12th. <laughs>In terms of my career, like I keep reminding people this all the time, like I'm not a full-time YouTuber, I still make most of my money freelancing as a video editor, but my hobby and my career have sort of begun to merge and the best examples of this were when I got to do those ultimate dream jobs of shooting promo videos for STA travel around the world. And we just got in and just went for a loop around the farm, it was just incredible. And it's kind of ironic, like on the Hong Kong to New York trip, on the East Coast of Australia, where I barely filmed anything, got told off for filming and nearly gave up on the whole thing, I then got paid to go back there four times and shoot the hell out of it. 
and on one of the trips when I was back at the Wit Sundays, by pure random luck, I was back on the exact same yacht, the British Defender, with the exact same captain, Captain Max. Three times more fun at all times. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> And the pinnacle of this journey was like running and hosting my first tour in Morocco. If I, th if I think back to like 10 years before that, when I was like ready to give up my career and just miserable and doing temp jobs, you know, from there to Morocco, because of the success of that trip that I did, that was just a pipe dream back then, it was just, it was unbelievable, you know? There was that moment when we were watching the sunset in the Sahara and then I was, I was holding back the tears, I was so happy, you know, and I'm sure there'll be some cynics who watch that video going, oh, he's just saying he's having the best time because it's his own tour and he's trying to sell tours, but the cynics can suck it. What I was saying was true, I was just overwhelmed with happiness. Cheers, buddy. That's what it's all about. Cheers. I was sitting there in the middle of the Sahara Desert and surrounding me are like friends I've known since I was a kid, other travel content creators I've met off the back of my YouTube channel, people who've booked on a tour because they've seen the YouTube channel, other friends I've met traveling, like Bart and Mike we met on hk 2 y and James was there as well, and I was just sitting there going, this is nuts, this is absolutely nuts. It's just incredible. It's uh, funny how life works out. <laughs> And it genuinely, genuinely was one of the happiest moments of my life. That's what we call fucking fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So I guess all that's left to say at the end of these very long retrospective videos is thank you. Thank you so much to each and every one of you that's watched the videos, liked the videos, commented, sent us all the lovely messages, come up to us in hostels and bars and all the rest of it. It, uh, it, it genuinely means the world to me and it's kind of hard to express my gratitude. So I guess, yeah, thank you is the best way of saying that. And like James and I always say, if you want to do what we've done, there's no magic trick to it. It's just as simple as work hard, save up, and when the time comes that we can properly travel again, just book a ticket and go.